Hello, I'm Professor Malati Mathur of the Faculty of English, the Indira Gandhi National Open University, that is IGNU. And I'm back again to talk about the romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. This is the second part of the video lecture. In the first part, we had covered his early years. And in this one, we'll be talking about his later years and focusing more on his creative output. Of course, with reference to certain things that were happening around him in his personal life, as well as in society and in political circles. Now we have two pictures here. The first one is uh, Shelley himself, the poet of volcanic hope, as he has been called. And the second one is of Mary Shelley, his wife. So finally, Shelley married Mary. And after they returned to England, they were in Switzerland earlier, where Shelley became friends, great friends with Lord Byron. And in 1816, after they returned to England, the two of them finally got married. And William Godwin, Mary's father, who had completely refused to speak to his daughter for being in such a relationship with Shelley, finally then reconciled with her and accepted his daughter back into the family. Harriet, Shelley's wife, had committed suicide earlier, as did Mary's sister as well. So there was a double tragedy in the family. And after Harriet's death, the courts ruled that Shelley would not have custody of his children and he would only be allowed to meet them once a month, which is about 12 times a year. So the children were sent to foster parents. Now life with Mary was quite peaceful in that sense and his creative output got an impetus. He wrote his first great poem called Alistair or the Spirit of Solitude in 1816. It was a non-political poem. It's known for its haunting beauty and it was written under the influence of another great romantic poet, Wordsworth. So the direct inspiration or may I say the influence was Wordsworth's poem, The Excursion. This was in 1814. Peacock introduced him to the study of Plato, who thereafter became a lifelong companion to Shelley, along with Homer, the Greek tragedians, and the Bible. Now that is a little surprising, but maybe not so surprising, because in the first part of Shelley's life, we did talk about how much Shelley was a man of contradictions. So although he did say, he did write about atheism, he, he was against religion, that did not stop him from freely, frequently referring to the Bible. So if that is not a man of contradictions, I don't know who could be. Mary, that is his wife, wrote a highly acclaimed book which is famous to this day, and that was Frankenstein. Now let's look at the poetic journey of Shelley. He wrote his longest poem called Leon and Sitna, or the revolution of the golden city. His publishers asked him to edit it because they found it just too unwieldy, and they also wanted him to find a new title for the work. So he brought it out after editing with the title the Revolt of Islam. The title may suggest the subject of Islam, but it had nothing to do with Islam in particular, because the focus of the poem was religion in general, and it had socialist and political themes. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. 
Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Shelley's health now deteriorated. They did not feel very comfortable in England, and Mary and Shelley then decided to migrate to Italy. He then left England permanently with Mary. He was never to come back to his birthplace. Italy saw the real blossoming of the genius that this poet was, because this place gave him a confidence which came from experience and maturity. Although you must remember, Shelley was still not even a middle-aged man. He was a very young man, but the kind of experience and maturity that he had developed, that now flowered into a number of wonderful poems. He himself said that loveliness of the earth and the serenity of the sky made the greatest difference in my sensations. I depend on these things, for in the smoke of cities and the tumult of humankind and the chilling fogs and rain of our own country, I can hardly be said to live. Italy had sunny weather. It was very different from the fog and the rain and the cold of England. And in this kind of weather, in these kind of surroundings, Shelley just blossomed. The fountains mingle with the rivers And the rivers with the oceans The winds of heaven mix forever With a sweet emotion Nothing in the world is single all things by a law divine In one spirit meet and mingle Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss high heaven And the waves clasp one another No sister flower would be forgiven If it disdained its brother And the sunlight clasps the earth and the moonbeams kiss the sea What is all this sweet work worth If thou kiss not me? Now life in Italy was a little different because he was so engrossed in writing. Now this little picture that I have is a poem that, it's a draft of a poem in Shelley's own handwriting. In Italy, one saw the greatest creative period of Shelley's life. There were a number of poems that he either completed or which he began and completed. For instance, he had already begun Rosalind and Helen, which he now completed. He embarked upon a major project of translation, which was Plato's Symposium. He also wrote lines on the Eugenian Hills, Julian and Medallo. He wrote a very, very famous poem. He wrote something which is still read to this day, Prometheus Unbound, a drama. He wrote The Senshi and the Mask of Anarchy and Men of England, a response to the Peterloo massacre in England. He also wrote his very famous Ode to the West Wind, which is, I think, studied by students at all levels, even in school, at the postgraduate level sometimes. So the Ode to the West Wind is one of his most noted poems. Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bysshe Shelley O oh, wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou 
from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilence-stricken multitudes. O oh, thou, who charitest to their dark wintry bed the winged seeds, where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow, the clarion o'er the dreaming earth, and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, with living hues and odors, plain and hill, wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here, oh here. Thou on whose stream, mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled bows of heaven and ocean, angels of rain and lightning, there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge, like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce maenad, even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm. Thou dirge of the dying year, to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre, vaulted with all thy congregated might of vapours, from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst, O oh, hear! Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams beside a pumous isle in Baye's bay, and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves in tenser day, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet the scents faints picturing them. Thou, for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean, know thy voice, and suddenly grow grey with fear, and tremble and despoil themselves. Oh, hear! If I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. If I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power, and share the impulse of thy strength, only less free than thou, O oh, uncontrollable. If even I were as in my boyhood, could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, as then, when to outstrip thy skyey speed, scarce seemed a vision. I would ne'er have striven as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need. Oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life. I bleed. A heavy weight of hours has chained and bowed one too like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep, audible tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou, spirit fierce, my spirit, be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe, like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And, by the incantation of this verse, scatter, as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind. Be through my lips to unawakened earth, the trumpet of a prophecy. O oh, wind, 
If winter comes, can spring be far behind? And then he also wrote a parody of Wordsworth's Peter Bell. He was not very happy with Wordsworth because he thought that Wordsworth had defected from the radical cause, that he had turned his back on the cause that Shelley held dear. He now had a circle of creativity. He formed the Pisan circle. Pisan is from the Italian city of Pisa, near which Shelley lived. And there were a number of friends in that circle, all creatively employed or those who were sources of inspiration. And this circle resulted in the creation or the composition of the poem Hellas in 1821. This was a lyrical drama on the Greek revolt against the Turks. Emilia Viviani was a beautiful 17 year old and she was the inspiration for a wonderful, beautiful poem called Epipsychidion in 1821 again. This poem, as the title suggests, is addressed to the Epipsyche, the soul out of my soul, or the beloved. There is an ironic reference in this poem to the Epithalmium, which is a conventional marriage song, such as those that Spencer wrote. I have already told you, if you remember, that Shelley was not in favor of the institution of marriage. He attacked the institution of marriage as the dreariest and longest journey and in fact praised free or true love. And as we can see from his life, he practiced both actually. He did practice free or true love when he lived with Mary Shelley before they got married, even inviting social censure, inviting the disapproval of her father. But then he also adopted, got into the institution of marriage, not once, but twice. The circle of creativity also included Edward Williams and his wife Jane, who were rather significant members, and this picture shows Jane. They were Shelley's companions till the end of his life, and he wrote a number of poems addressed to Jane, with a guitar to Jane, to Jane the invitation, when the lamp is shattered, to Jane the keen stars were twinkling, lines written in the Bay of Ritchie, a number of poems. And I have here, again for you, which might interest you, a picture of the guitar that Shelley presented to Jane. He was a little troubled by the fact that his friendship with Jane or his affection for Jane might lead to a little bit of marital discord. But at the same time, this friendship, this relationship, led to a lot of writing. The circle of creativity continued when Shelley persuaded Byron to join the circle in 1821. And Edward John Trelawney joined in 1822. Now he is significant because he wrote a record of the lives of Shelley and Byron, which we can still read and which tells us a number of things about these two poets. Trelawney was present at the cremation of Shelley also along with Byron. Autumn, a dirge by Percy B. Shelley. The warm sun is failing, the bleak wind is wailing, the bare boughs are sighing, the pale flowers are dying, and the year? And the earth, her deathbed in a shroud of leaves, dead, is lying. Come months, come away from November to May in your saddest array. Follow the bier of the dead cold year, and like dim shadows, watch by her sepulchre. The chill rain is falling, the nipped worm is crawling, the rivers are swelling, the thunder is knelling for the year. The blithe swallows are flown, and the lizards itch gone to his dwelling. Come months, come away, put on white, black, and gray, let your light sisters play, 
ye follow the bier of the dead cold year and make her grave green with tear on tear. Towards the end, again a small picture with a sketch of the boats that were owned by Shelley and Byron. Both of them loved sailing. They had their own boats and Mary and Shelley bought their own schooner which Shelley named the Ariel. Now if you can recall Shakespeare's The Tempest, Ariel is a very significant character in that play. So I suppose that Shelley did have this association in mind. He named his boat the Ariel. He wrote his last unfinished poem, The Triumph of Life, when he went off by himself in the moonlight in his boat, in his shallop. Mary has recorded saying that she had never seen Shelley in a happier mood than he was at that point of time. If the past and future could be obliterated, the present could content me so well that I could say with Faust to the passing moment, remain thou, thou art so beautiful. Shelley found life, everything about how he was living it, what he was writing, the quality of writing that poured out from his pen, everything he found beautiful, that he had absolutely nothing to complain about. In the final moments on July 8th, 1822, when he had not even turned 30 years old, Shelley drowned while sailing his schooner. The papers reported the death as an accident, although there was some evidence that might point to a murder. It could have been a murder by an enemy who detested his political beliefs, but we do not know. There are some people who do think that this may not have been an accident at all. In his pockets, they found a volume of Aeschylus, the Greek writer, and Keats's poems. And interestingly, the volume of Keats's poems was found open at a certain page as though Shelley had been reading it and had just put it into his pocket to get back to it later, which unfortunately he never did. His body was cremated on the beach where it had been washed ashore by the waves of the sea. And in this picture that I have included here, there is a small group of friends standing at the cremation. Trelawney, who, if you remember, wrote a record of the lives of Shelley and Byron, at the last moment snatched Shelley's heart from the flames and he kept it with him because he thought that Shelley's heart was the core of his being, that was the fountainhead of all his impulses and his creativity, and he could not bear to see Shelley's heart being consumed by the flames. Shelley's ashes were interred, they were buried near Keats in the Protestant cemetery in Rome, but about a, more than a hundred years later, he was memorialized in the Poets' Corner in England, in London, in Westminster Abbey, which has a separate section for these English poets. So to sum up what we have been saying about Shelley, we've talked about his life, we have talked about his creative output. So what is it that we can say with any measure of certainty? One, of course, which stands out so prominently is that he was a man of contradictions. What he believed, what he wrote, there could be so many things that were at odds with each other. He was filled with the fire of rebellion. He completely endorsed the cause of those who were not privileged and he felt that he had to stand up for those who did not have a voice of their own. And if you remember that he perished before he even turned 30 years old, and imagine that in that short life, what a brilliant output of creativity 
this man has given to us. Look at the legacy of poetry that Shelley has left us. In a, at an age where most people do not even know what they think, they do not even have any convictions or be able to articulate them with any kind of passion or conviction. Shelley was able to write and convey to us such profound philosophical ideals and to be able to tell us what his idea of the world or society should be and what he felt we should all aspire to be. In that sense, Shelley can be said to be the embodiment of romantic thought, of romantic ideals and imagery. This picture that I have included here is of his tombstone. It evokes a certain sense of melancholy in us when we think of the talent that still lay unawakened. Art thou pale for weariness of climbing heaven and gazing on the earth, wandering companionless among the stars that have a different birth and ever changing like a joyless eye that finds no object worth its constancy? Who knows what Shelley could have given us? if he had been given a longer life. What kind of poems, what kind of criticism could he have given us once he had matured even more? But that, of course, we'll never know. I would like you again to attempt this quiz where you just have to do a very simple thinking over what we have already said, what we have gone through related to Shelley's life and work. You just have to say whether it is true or false and you can check the answers right at the end. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope you have been able to add something to your knowledge of Shelley and his work with this video lecture. And I'll be back talking to you about other poets, other topics. Goodbye. Thank you.